In the United States, over the last decade, 60,000 pedestrians died under the wheels of an automobile. One million pedestrians were injured. Join us for the next half hour as we take a look at perils for pedestrians. On this episode, we meet the Bicycle and Pedestrian Coordinator for Durham, North Carolina. Then we learn about the Triangle Transit Authority that serves Raleigh, Durham, and Chapel Hill. Finally, we visit the Cooper River Bridge in Charleston, South Carolina. Stay tuned! We're in Durham, North Carolina, talking with Allison Carpenter, who's the Bicycle and Pedestrian Coordinator. What does a Bike and Ped Coordinator do? Oh, wow. I, I do a lot of stuff. Um, a lot of planning efforts. We're working on a pedestrian plan for the city and a bicycle plan for the county of Durham. And um, trying to work on some education, bicycle education materials, um, doing some outreach. We have Bike to Work Week coming up in May, so we are working on an event uh, for Bike to Work Day on May 19th. Um, so I've got my hands in a lot of pots, just kind of doing some, you know, um, planning, program outreach, um, things like that. So. What's, what's, what's the background on the, the pedestrian plan? How'd, that, how'd the idea for that get started? Well, actually, um, the state, North Carolina DOT Bicycle and Pedestrian Division, um, had some money in 2004 for bicycle and pedestrian planning grants. And um, this was actually before I started with the city of Durham. Uh, one of my colleagues applied for a pedestrian grant for the city and received some funding. Um, and the Public Works Department chipped in um, as well. And so we hired a Lewis Berger Group um, and Carrie to work on our uh, pedestrian plan. And it's been a huge 11 month effort and really successful, I think. It's um, driven a lot of. Um, uh, we've done a lot of public involvement and outreach, and I think um, it's gotten a lot of support from the community. So, um, yeah, that's that's our pedestrian planning grant. What 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 sort of things go into a pedestrian plan? I mean, what the uh, I flip through it. What am I going to see? Well. Um, you know, it's looking at programmatic issues, um, so what kinds of um, encouragement, education, enforcement programs can Durham do to help make uh, the, the pedestrian environment more friendly? Um, and it's also got some policy recommendations, how can Durham update its ordinances and policies to also be more pedestrian friendly? And then it's got some uh, project uh, prioritization, looking at uh, missing sidewalk gaps, sidewalk maintenance, intersection improvements and things like that, and prioritizing based on community input, you know, which projects are the most important and, and should be built first. So, um, so it's, you know, kind of a holistic, comprehensive outlook at, you know, how to make Durham um, a more walkable city. And, uh, bike planning that's going on, it's uh, a few months behind the pedestrian planning. Mm -hmm. uh, what sort of things are being looked at in the bicycle plan? Well, in the bike plan, um, we're also, you know, it's also focusing on the four E's, um, engineering, education, enforcement, and encouragement. Um, so we're looking at uh, you know, on-road transportation facilities and trying to prioritize some um, some on-road routes in our route network and uh, looking at connections to trails and greenways. Um, we're doing some, you know, looking at what kinds of education and outreach we can do to improve the, the biking environment and get more support in the community. Um, and it's really sort of in, you know, in the earlier stages, so we don't have all the recommendations uh, for the bike plan yet, but um, it's coming along and you know, as the pedestrian plan, it's gotten you know a lot of community support, and I think um, we'll have a good a good working document in the end, and hopefully um, we'll have some some money behind it to actually do some of the uh, implementation. So, um, you came here from Madison, Wisconsin, which is known for being a, one of the better bicycling cities yeah. in the U.S. Uh, what? Uh, what, what lessons uh, can you bring here from what you were doing up there? Uh, I mean, is, do you have the potential to have, have the similar reputation here? Yeah, I mean, I, obviously, geographically, Durham's a lot different than Madison because Madison's an isthmus. It's just kind of a one-mile uh, island almost, um, you know, in the middle between two lakes. Um, so geographically, we're a lot different. But I think Durham, um, you know, Durham's got 
some great historical infrastructure. You know, we've got a lot of pedestrian scale buildings that are still, you know, um, around in the downtown area on 9th Street here. And um, we've got a great grid system in the urban core. Um, you know, I think overall, great neighborhoods, you know, in the downtown area. Um, a lot of arts and culture and great restaurants. And, you know, I think there's a lot going on in Durham. As far as what I learned in Madison, um, you know, I guess I learned that education and encouragement are key, just letting people know, um, you know, the bikes are allowed on the road, um, you know, give, getting out information to people about uh, bike and pedestrian laws and um, infrastructure um, is really key and kind of galvanizing some community support for, for these things is also really important. So I guess I took some lessons from Madison along those lines and brought them back here to Durham and I hope that I'm implementing some of them. So. We're in Raleigh, North Carolina, uh, talking with John Talmadge with the Triangle Transit Authority. What is the authority and what do you do for him? The Triangle Transit Authority is the regional public transportation agency in this region of North Carolina, which is Wake, Durham, and Orange Counties. Wake County is the city of Raleigh, Durham, obviously, Durham count, uh, City, and Chapel Hill is the major jurisdiction in Orange County. And we provide public transportation services to all three, connecting the local transit agencies in each of those municipalities. I'm the director of commuter resources at the Triangle Transit Authority, and we handle the service, service planning, the marketing, the customer service, and the outreach to employers. Now, how does the, the regional transit authority uh, coordinate with uh, some of the local transit services, uh, since, since some of these jurisdictions have their own buses? Um, well, operationally, I mean, for the customer, they, we have transfer points with each of the local agencies in the downtown areas. So here in Raleigh, transfer point is called Moore Square, and uh, our buses come in uh, every about 15 minutes in the morning and afternoon peak periods, uh, and then less, less, frequency, less frequently during other times of the day. And similarly in downtown Durham and Chapel Hill, uh, also in the town of Cary, which newly uh, has public transportation service. So people can connect from any point in the Triangle, really, to any other point using a combination of local services and TTA's regional routes. And then we try and help people understand and make those connections. We created a regional website, gotriangle.org, with a trip planner that includes all the agency's routes, their stops, the timetables, so someone could put in there where they start from and where they're going to, and it'll, regardless of the agency, find the best way for them to get there on, on the bus service. So the, the commuter looking for options doesn't have to go to multiple places then to find information? That's right. We're trying to uh, really beef up that service and plan to do so in the next few months, but right now you can go to this website do, get the trip planning information. You can link to carpool matching, which gives you online instant uh, results of people who live near you and, and work near you. It's primarily for commute trips. Uh, and then we'll be adding information about the van pool service that exists, about biking and walking opportunities, and uh, telecommuting, working from home. You know, what, what sort of things are you able to do to try to reach out to the public. Uh, I know with every time gasoline prices go up, uh, people are looking for new alternatives. Uh, how can you reach out to them and, and let them know what options they have? Well, there are a number of different ways, and uh, programs like this is a great opportunity. Free media through local um, television stations, they're often covering gas prices options. The newspapers have done a good job, but back in September, uh, after the hurricanes hit and the prices spiked, we happened to be running our Smart Commute Challenge campaign. It's a six-week campaign that uh, uses prize incentives to get people to try something other than driving themselves to work uh, one, at least once during that six-week period. Because for a lot of people, the mental change is starting from, I never think about anything but getting in my car. And the first small step is, hey, there might be an option that I want to consider once in a while. And that's where we start is, getting techniques to get people to start thinking that there might be an option and then provide the resources so that once they're at that point we can tell them exactly how it is that they can use these. With the Smart Commute Challenge and the gas prices uh, we saw ridership increases of 25 percent for a couple months 
um, and it's uh, stabilized at 10% growth over the, the prior year. We saw huge numbers uh, of people going to the carpool matching website, um, whereas it was dozens of people or even 100 people, we had several thousand of people go um, in September and October, and it's still multiple hundreds of people um, coming each, each month. So uh, the gas price has certainly grabbed people's attention, and our uh, idea is feed people the information that they're looking for, uh, because each time the price goes up a little bit, it's a different set of people who are saying it's too expensive and I need different options. Yeah. What do you do for, uh, with Bike to Work Day in this region? Has that been a, a success? Um, it's been growing over time, and there are new um, bicycle and pedestrian uh, committees in Durham and Chapel Hill and Raleigh that have been working hard over the last few years. This year, TTA is going to get involved in uh, taking region-wide region, region -wide a pilot project that was done in Research Triangle Park last year, and that's to try and pair up people who are currently bike commuters with people who are interested in it. And it's a bike mentoring or a bike buddy program that during that week they'll uh, go in together so that the newbie um, can really get comfortable and feel like someone's there who knows the route, knows how to ride safely, and has been doing it for a while. So that's going to be the big part. And then there are also celebration breakfasts in both Raleigh and Durham that we'll be a part of to um, provide another little incentive for people who are uh, bike commuting during the week. Where does transit work best? Well, since every transit rider is also a pedestrian, um, typically at both ends of the trip, unless you're parking and riding at one spot, uh, it's where there's a concentration of activities and a good pedestrian network. A campus like this here at NC State does very well, both with our regional bus service, uh, the local bus service, and their own campus shuttle system that distributes people. Um, the same thing for the other major universities at uh, UNC, at Duke University, state government employment downtown, these are the places where you can give people a fairly quick ride on the bus service. They get off, they walk a few blocks, and they're where they want to be. The places um, that aren't working so well uh, are the suburban areas where you have a lot of transfers, you have long walks between buildings, or that pedestrian environment is inhospitable, you're along the side of a busy road, uh, or a fast driving road, or there aren't many sidewalks. Um, so we have found, and we're trying to concentrate resources bringing people in and out of the universities, in the downtown areas, um, and then secondary markets are some of the suburban uh, office areas. What can be done to market to the public other than you know, broadcast marketing through uh, the, the general media? The real trick is to give people exactly the information that they're looking for in a place where they can use it. We were pleased to be part of a nationwide pilot project uh, Pro program called Individualized Marketing. It's been used successfully in Europe and places in Australia. Even Portland has been uh, doing it in the last few years. And uh, we did it here in Durham. And one of the things that we saw is that just giving people specific information, a local access map where they could see where they can walk in their neighborhood, uh, bus stop information, what's the nearest bus stop, what's the specific timetable, rather than giving them a bunch of schedules and they have them figured out themselves, that the reduction in car trips from the group that got this intervention and a control group was 7% fewer trips. A lot of those are walking trips, a lot of them in the middle of the day, a lot of them are older people who, because they're not thinking about anything other than driving their car, just need someone to come to them. They don't want to go and get the information. They want someone to come to them, give them the specific information about their choices, and it motivates a lot of people. Um, it's in the principle of behavior change and the first step in it is getting people to break the mindset of there's only one way for me to travel and this was a successful pilot here and we're hoping to use it more broadly in the coming years. We're in Charleston, South Carolina talking with Don Sparks who's president of Charleston Moves. What is Charleston Moves? John Charleston Moves is a new nonprofit here in Charleston, South Carolina, who's dedicated to promote cycling, walking, and transit use for healthier lifestyles and healthy communities. And what's the connection between these modes of transportation and, and a healthy community, healthy lifestyle? You know, there's a kind of a story about the uh, coal mines in the 1800s up in Pennsylvania, where they put a canary. You may have heard this story. They put a canary in with the miners, and with the canary uh, didn't breathe, it was trouble, the miners all left. 
And so I see cycling and, and walking and some, in some degree transit as a canary for the uh, judgment of healthy cities. In other words, if you go to a town or a city that doesn't have people out actively outside walking around, walking around and cycling around, it seems to me that's not a healthy community. And so bikes and walking and pedestrians are kind of like the canary in the coal mine. If we don't see them, that's not a healthy community. So what we're trying to do is figure out ways to promote uh, public policies, to encourage uh, people to, to use things other than the cars to get around. And that's what you see behind you now is a good example. This bridge is a good example of that effort. What is this bridge? This is, uh, you're looking at the uh, second longest cable stay bridge uh, in North America. It's uh, a little over two and a half miles long. Uh, it took about six years to build. And it uh, was originally designed just to move cars right across this, this, this river. This is the uh, Cooper River. And Charlestonians like to say on one side of Charleston, the Cooper River, and the other side is the Ashley. And where they come together, they form the Atlantic Ocean. And so this is one of the, one of the tributaries. And it links two major communities in the state. When DOT came up with the plans about seven years ago to build this bridge, they had no intention of allowing uh, bikes and pedestrians. It was only going to be for cars. And a group of citizens, in fact, Tom Mather, who just ran by, and about six or eight others, including myself, uh, decided that we thought that that would not be a bridge for the 21st century. And we, we pressured the uh, community to uh, our state DOT and our mayors and elected officials to include uh, something besides cars. And what you see now is a, a wonderful, well-used, uh, well-loved, facility on this bridge that allows people to get across the river here without out using a car. And we're very uh, excited about, about what this has done. It's, it's raised the level of uh, consciousness. It's also given pol uh, politicians a comfort level because before they were very hesitant to uh, come out in favor of anything other than traditional car use. And we, the campaign to make this bridge walkable and bikeable lasted over two years and we sent out 30,000 uh, postcards, about 30,000 bumper stickers, uh, which said, can't, wi can't wait to bike the bridge, and can't wait to run the new bridge. And um, we saw those bumper stickers everywhere. It took a while, but the mayors, Mayor uh, Woods Flower was the mayor at the time in Mount Pleasant, and Joe Riley here in Charleston, uh, took this on early on and became advocates uh, of this, this lane. And pretty soon, even DOT came on board. It was a long fight, and it looked like it wouldn't uh, happen for a while, but uh, it was a community effort, a very good example of how a community uh, at a grassroots level can get together and get something done, get something accomplished. The um, DOT had objections about cost. The cost about, uh, I've never seen the exact actual, actual uh, final amount, but uh, somewhere between 10 and 25 million. I think about 20 million to add on this, uh, what they call an amenity, which I don't like the term because an amenity to me implies some extra like a, a, a potted plant or something. This is actual, not an amenity. This is a, this is a structure part of the bridge. It's a necessary way to get across particularly with higher gas prices and, and whatever. So um, this raised, as I mentioned, this raised the comfort level of politicians. All of a sudden they said, oh, wait a minute, people are actually using this thing. I'm getting kudos for this. People are congratulating me, the politicians, for uh, getting this done. Maybe I can support this in other places. And so now we've got um, a much higher uh, level of support, much deeper level of support uh, from politicians and from just normal folks who at one time might have thought this would be not used or or would be uh, a waste of taxpayers' money and boondoggle. And that's not the opinion anymore. All over town I go, even all over the state when I'm talking to people, they're saying, oh, that bridge, I love that bridge. And the, you know, the biggest thing I hear about it when I ask people about their use, and I come up here at least once a week and walk or ride my bike over it, uh, people from Chicago or Charlotte or Miami will be on the bridge and I'll talk to them and they'll say, uh, oh, we love this bridge, but why didn't they make it this lane? Why didn't they make it wider? You know, and, and that was always a big contention too. We wanted it 15 feet, which would have been closer to Ashto guidelines, and um, um, which would have given us uh, five feet in each for each lane. But we're uh, at 12 feet, so that's it's, it's uh, certainly an accomplishment. So, when the South Carolina DOT is, is working on other bridges, do you think it'll be tough to <laughs> convince them to include ped bike facilities on them after the experience here? Well, that's a great question, John. Um, our uh, DOT uh, director is Elizabeth Mabry in Columbia, South Carolina, our capital. And she has got an a incredibly good vision of making this state more bike and pedestrian friendly. You know, we are at the low end of the totem pole uh, or the high end, depending on which way you measure it. We have, in other words, we have the fourth, depending on the year, between the second and fourth highest fatality rate for pedestrians and bikes in the country. In fact, Charleston County has some of the highest in the state. So you're actually sitting at ground zero of some of the most dangerous uh, cycling pedestrian um, 
areas in the, in the country. But Ms. Mabry has, uh, has really come out in, in favor of um, accommodating bikes and pedestrians in all new, new DOT projects. However, unfortunately, even with her commitment, as, as strong as it appears to be and as good-natured as it appears to be, it doesn't seem to be translated down to the ground. So a lot of engineers at the Highway Department, or Highway SE, DOT, a lot of the engineers aren't as uh, well-versed in these issues. They've been going by the same standards for the last 50 years, the World War II, post-World War II, move cars as fastly as you can, as quickly as you can, and as safely as you can, but don't worry too much about bikes or, or pedestrians. And that attitude really hasn't filtered down yet in our state, unfortunately. But we have the leadership, whether now we can see uh, whether or not that leadership will translate down to building the kind of facilities like the one you see here that uh, will encourage active living by design, or active, as I like to say, actually active living by default. In other words, it should be the default option should be walk to the store, take your kid by foot to school or by bike, uh, go to church by bike or walking, go to your office. Those things should be done by default, not by uh, some kind of sacrifice or, or um, some sort of big uh, uh, emotional commitment or some sort of big financial commitment. In fact, those options are much cheaper than driving, as you well know. Maintaining a car costs about five or $6,000 a year, according to AAA. And um, bikes, I guess, you know, $500 a year, or maybe less, by a used bike. Some new bikes cost 5000 that's true. But uh, anyway, the point is, this type of transportation, cycling, walking, using transit, things that Charleston Moves stands for, are, are very uh, socially conservative or fiscally conservative, financially conservative modes of transportation. And we think um, the future is in those kind. We're trying to figure out ways to help um, help politicians see that as well, and poli policymakers and, and the designers. As if you weren't busy enough here in South Carolina, uh, what's your involvement at the national level? The uh, national level has moved quite a long way as well in the last few years. I'm almost in tandem with our local efforts. I I'm on the board of the League of American Bicyclists. It's the oldest bicycle advocacy group in the nation. We just celebrated our 125th anniversary. We have about 40,000 members across the country. We represent all aspects of cycling, from the mountain bikers to the uh, long distance tourists, to the uh, jocks who just ran by here, or cycled by here rather, uh, to uh, casual riders. Uh, the league's mission is to uh, encourage cycling uh, for fun, uh, fitness and transportation, which really says it all for cycling, fun, fitness and transportation. Get around by your bike safely um, as a way of, of transportation or as recreation. The league has been very successful in moving the uh, national agenda to get federal support for bike uh, for facilities like this. Um, it's called the um, uh, Next T L U, uh, excuse me, Safe T L U. It's the uh, uh, forgive me if I can't quite remember the acronym. It's a it's a the grandchild of Ice T, which you're familiar with. Um, uh, basically, it's the federal transportation bill that keeps things going for exactly, half a dozen years. Exactly, and every year the League of American Bicyclists, along with some partners, promotes a um, National Bike Summit in Washington, and this year was the sixth annual one. And at that summit, advocates from around the, around the country come and uh, go to their state representatives, their congressmen and senators, and ask them to uh, support higher level of federal funding for for uh, cycling and pedestrian. And it's been quite successful. We have now the highest level of, of funding ever. Um, senators and congressmen are, are, are signing on. There's a congressional bike caucus that uh, promotes the issues for, for cyclists. And the league is the only national organization doing that, and uh, it's, about, it's a nonprofit, of course, and uh, it's membership-based, and it's trying to make sure that cyclists have the rights to the road, and cyclists have facilities they can use safely, and, and encourage people to get on their bikes uh, more often, and, uh, and 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 use bikes as opposed to cars. By the way, I own a car, so I'm not anti-car. I'm just a pro bike. I was to come back here to Charleston in 10 years or 20 years. Uh, what would you hope that I'd, I'd see that might be a little different than today? Well, uh, there's all sorts of, my vision is um, when I go to other cities around the world and see the best of those places. I travel a lot in Europe and uh, teach there every summer. And uh, I was just out in, in Portland in Davis, California, which is a LAB platinum level bicycle friendly community. They just got that awarded this last uh, March at the uh, Bike Summit. Uh, um, that's the premier highest rating you can get for a community in, in the USA. And uh, right now, uh, I would like to think that people would say Charleston is getting close to being the Davis of the, uh, of the East Coast, 
But I'm hoping in 15 years people will say, oh yeah, Davis is the Charleston of the West Coast. So we'll, we'll switch, uh, we'll switch uh, uh, positions. I would like to see this city in, in 10 or 15 years where uh, people like these guys riding by are not the minority, but that uh, bikes are looked at as a mainstream, everyday way to get around to, to, for recreation or for transportation, that the politicians uh, ride their bikes to, to work on occasion, that uh, town council meetings uh, encourage uh, participation by, by bikes and transit and, and walking. And the facilities will be there so that when you go shopping, you can pull your bike up and there'll be, a, instead of a telephone pole where you try to find and lock your bike to, there'll be, be a, uh, encouraging and uh, welcoming bike parking that, uh, that uh, owners of uh, establishments will have, particularly large office buildings, will have showers for their employees, will give them uh, uh, credits for riding their bike instead of walking. If they provide parking, they would give the same amount of, of income and parking uh, as opposed to, uh, to, to cycling, you know, as, as, as opposed to giving them parking space. I mean, I could just see it transformed, and in so doing, I think that canary uh, will be a lot, uh, lot stronger that I talked about earlier. That canary will, will be a lot healthier, and so the city will be more vital. And it tracks, I think, we, college towns like Charleston and, and uh, Davis, California, they attract uh, people who I think are interested in these kind of issues, that are interested in sustainability and keeping the planet a little, little more uh, healthy for the future generations. And this, you know, riding a bike and walking is not uh, the answer uh, by any means, but it is a, one part of many answers to this issue. And uh, it's, it's broader than just trying to get people on bike or out of their cars. It's the way we plan our communities. It's the way we build our buildings in our communities. It's the way we get around to those buildings. It's all integrated. and. Uh, no one agency or no one uh, organization, I think, can try to promote all those agendas. So we're quite uh, uh, content, or I should say maybe even overwhelmed, trying to promote a couple of points in that agenda, which is trying to get uh, people uh, alternatives, choices. And we also think that's a very uh, American thing to do. Why should uh, people be forced into one mode of transportation when you have obvious choices? And so I think a lot of this is about, about choice. and. Uh, uh, allowing people to make that choice so that they're not trapped in, in one mode. This happens, I think, to be the right choice and uh, the more sustainable one. Visit us on the internet at www.pedestrians.org.